Welcome to another episode of Cocktails with Creatives. Uh, today, I have some good friends and colleagues from Creative Repertoire Initiative, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Uh, tell me where you're coming from, your pet's names, your name, and what adaptable cocktail are you drinking today? Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Jolly. I hail from Lubbock, Texas, which is West Texas. Um, and I have two cats, kind of. So I'll explain that in a second. So I have an orange tabby named Orange Julius, and he goes by Julius for short, or Mr. Julius, or various like variations on that. And then I have a very tiny calico medium hair uh, named Calpurnia. So it's like Julius and Calpurnia. Um, and I also now have a collection of backyard cats. So we have like a Cleo, short for Cleopatra, <laughs> and, and Lolo, which is little orange, and Alfie, and I feel like now there's a Phineas. <laughs> I'll just stop. It's just that that's where I'm at in my life. And uh, with regards to what I'm drinking, this is a concoction that's been made in the Jolly Tentler household. Um, I don't know if it's a if a, it's a play on a Tom Collins, like a loose Tom Collins or like a cucumber gin cooler, but because I'm hailing from West Texas, you need some mezcal. So it's nice and smoky. So that is what I'm drinking, my friends. Cheers. Wonderful. Um, and I'm going to go to John next because he's the next person next to me on, on the screen. Great. Hi, uh, I'm John Mackey. I live uh, currently in San Francisco, California. Um, we've been here about a year, I guess. Um, we were in Boston for a long time before that, and Austin, Texas before that, and LA before that. Um, and uh, we just moved into this house about two months ago. It's a uh, Lit, we're a couple blocks from the Castro neighborhood, if you know San Francisco at all. Um, and uh, we have two cats, Noodle and Blue. Uh, we, I guess we can't really see them right now. They're up over by the door sniffing the sniffs. And um, my cocktail, so what I made is a uh, gimlet, which normally a uh, gimlet is, I think, tradition. I don't know if it actually was invented by like the Rose's Lime Juice people, but it's like normally like gin and Rose's Lime Juice or, ro or gin and uh, lime juice, like fresh lime and simple syrup is like the better way to do it. Um, but the way I have adapted it is uh, I'm using botanist gin, um, which I was told by a bartender here in San Francisco when I asked him to make me uh, a botanist gimlet. He was like, oh, you shouldn't use lime with botanist gin because lemon will be better. And I'm like, is that a gimlet? He's like, I'm saying it's a gimlet, so it's a gimlet. So it is a gimlet made with uh, botanist gin and uh, simple syrup and uh, fresh lemon. And um, to flex or adapt it even more, I had a half of a blood orange in the fridge and I squeezed that in to make it pretty for <laughs> So there is a blood, it's a blood orange lemon gimlet. So cheers. Cheers. Um, and uh, to Alex. Greetings, hi. Um, I'm Alex Shapiro. I live on San Juan Island, Washington State, off, floating off the coast of America on the Canadian border. And um, I have two cats, actually Dan and I have two cats, I should say. Um, Jake, who weighs 24 or 5 pounds, but he has been on a diet for years, and um, Bob, who is a Manx, thus Bob, and <laughs> Bob is black and white, Jake is big and orange, like a big pumpkin on paws, and, uh, and Bob looks like an orca kitty, black and white. And they're absolutely adorable. And we have, like Jen, we've got visitors that come by the, you know, the glass doors and stuff from the neighborhood. And, and we, we have never met a cat we don't like. So, so far, we're a group of cat people, apparently. And uh, my drink today is a Manhattan. And I called dibs on Manhattans when we start, decided to do this because I'm from Manhattan. I like to say I grew up on an island half the size of the one I live on now. And with just a lot more people. And um, Manhattans are traditionally, I think everybody knows, it's traditionally pretty much a two to one kind of thing of your favorite bourbon or rye and uh, some vermouth, some red vermouth, and then a splash of bitters to taste. And then you garnish it usually, um, you know, a, a cherry, you know, something like this. 
or a uh, and or a slice of citrus for decoration and a little citrusy flavor really nice and i figured you know we are always as creative in our lives as we are in our careers right and adaptable music means adaptable cocktails so i have laid out in front of me you know here's the normal stuff that you would expect my my tried and true i love uh, the supermarket brands that i love there are two of them makers mark and uh, Woodford Reserve, right? Those are very smooth and reliable. If you're gonna get really fancy schmancy, I don't even know if you can find it these days because they're behind on production, but uh, Blanton's, that is an amazing bourbon. It used to be about a hundred bucks a pop for a bottle, well worth it, you know, it's just incredible. But now, I, Lord only knows what it is now, but that's a splurge. Anyway, so I'm doing this with Maker's Mark, and then over here, we have, I just want to give you a little guided tour, you know, different kinds of vermouth, whatever you want. Um, you could go really wild and do a little, you know, Fernet bitters, add some of that. Campari and Aperol, either one of them are really terrific for a little bit of that bittersweet kind of thing going on. And then we get into our citrusy world. I love, and this is what I'm drinking today, the bourbon with the Cointreau. If you don't have Cointreau, cheaper triple sec will do the job. You know, it's like the poor man's Cointreau. It's just fine. It's just um, not as expensive a bottle. And then you can also do Drambouille is a really nice uh, little surprise touch to do instead of those as well. And or if you want to get really weird, you could do a little Chambord, which is a raspberry liqueur. And back here, Amaretto. And even, believe it or not, I have tried this. I have tried this. Some nice um, cognac, a little nice VSOP cognac will um, blend well with the bourbon too. And then to top it off, not only can you do the aforementioned traditional cherries, but you can actually, you can actually, believe it or not, not only throw in a slice of citrus, either grapefruit, I know that sounds non-traditional, it's good, Tr grapefruit, orange, lemon, lime, or believe it or not, I did this the other night because Dan, my wonderful man of almost a decade, has an enormous farm and uh, he grows a lot of, he's got a huge orchard. So he brought back a whole bunch of pears and I took a pear slice, put it in there. Oh, it's so good. So try it out. The cool thing, it's just like with music, you know, our cocktails can be adapt as adaptable as our pieces. So for the time being, we are the um, cocktail repertoire initiative for, for, for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so Cheers! Oh god, that is so much more interesting. I, dang, like we should have done that. I learn something from Alex every single time I see her. Yeah. I'm not only fun, I'm educational. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Thank you. The more you know. <laughs> By the way, speaking of Dan, I just have to give a shout out. You may be noticing the very beautiful kitchen I am standing in. Um, standing being an operative word, as I said before we got started, this for I think most of us who are well known on Zoom, this is the first time in about six months that anybody has seen us actually upright standing with legs and something from you know beyond just the boobs up, okay? So this is exciting. But also the kitchen behind me, Dan built the entire thing. He's a master woodworker and cabinet and furniture maker and this is all sapile wood so is the counter and it's just exquisite we bought this house three years ago and he's been working on it ever since every corner of the house so i just had to give a shout out to my honey because he's an amazing artist a absolutely uh, and uh, uh pete pete well i have to follow that now don't i that's um <laughs> it's a, say that's nice exciting. things about your wife <laughs> pete <laughs> I've only got nice things to say about it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Pete Meekin. I'm, I'm a Brit, but I live in Winnipeg, Canada, where we're now starting to get pretty chilly. We get very nice summers and very cold winters. Um, I've got two dogs, so I'm a dog person, but both of them are smaller than your 24-pound cat. They're both <laughs> miniature wiener dogs, Stevie and Jürgen, named after... Uh, current coach and former player of my soccer team, uh, Liverpool, who are the love of my life other than my wife. Yeah. So, uh, and um, I'm drinking a margarita and it's pretty much a straightforward one. 
Um, but the reason I picked that was because I was trying to think of what to drink. And I was starting to think about what, what was the last time I had a cocktail with, you know, another musician somewhere. And I realized it probably was in San Antonio at TMEA and probably with John, I think we had a margarita. And that night we were having margaritas with Ryan Anthony, who has since less, left us. So I figured I would grab a drink and we can toast him and say to good health and uh, good life. Cheers. Cheers. And since it's my show, you all know who I am. Um, but uh, the today I'm drinking a old fashioned, um, probably my go to drink. Um, I did it just a little bit my way, though. Um, and I'm using uh, I have an orange garnish and cherries. Um, and I use Aperol um, with my old fashioned because I like that little bit of citrus. Um, and I also include uh, just a splash of um, like a grapefruit seltzer. Right now I'm using LaCroix um, just because it adds to just that little bit of extra uh, like citrusy taste that I really love. Um, and that's my adaptable cocktail. So cheers to all. Thank you all for being here. I'm very excited to, to have you all on. The most number of people on the show so far. So uh, we'll see how it goes. I think maybe the first place to start is um, adaptable repertoire. What is adaptable repertoire? Um, and and I feel always feel like Alex speaks the most eloquently about anything. <laughs> Whenever Alex talks about, I feel like I, I I also feel smarter when I hear her say it, even if I already know it. So, <laughs> and that's not to like to put Alex on the spot. Also, I haven't had enough to drink yet to be interesting. So actually, I, I, I was going to say your compliment is the result of copious amounts of alcohol. No, so. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm dodging because I'm still sober. Great. Well, Great. I'm going to we'll all jump in on this. I will start us off and then I'm going to toss the ball to Jen and Pete and adaptable music is just that it means that instead of your regular, normal, predictable instrumentation that you might have for either wind band or orchestra uh, or any large ensemble, you're able to have any number of different instruments and any different instruments playing different lines of music. Some pieces work better than others if they're being adapted to be adaptable. But in general, the concept is be able to adapt, and in this case, adapt to the times that we've been in since March, uh, where suddenly ensembles are a very uncertain and unpredictable personnel, and we want to make sure they've got really great repertoire to play. Pete. Yeah, for me, it's kind of, it's pretty exciting on, on several fronts because um, I, whilst I live in Winnipeg, we're about 800,000 of 1.3 million people in the whole province. And so consequently, there's lots of um, rural teaching that happens, very small band classes, instrumental music classes. And the pretty neat thing about um, these pieces that have been created and the forum uh, that we, we've, we've founded for other composers and band directors to connect is that um, all these rural teachers are so pumped to be able to actually have music that they can use in their regular classes, um, which actually their regular classes aren't too different to what now aren't too different to what they were before, because you'd maybe teach four kids in one school, then one kid in the next school, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's kind of neat that there's a repertoire for them. Um, and I'm married to a, a, a music and band teacher who at the moment is teaching K through four in a field, in a school field, which is kind of fun. but. The point is that she doesn't know what instrumentation she's going to get on any given day. And so the, the ability to just take any of this and still make music happen and give the kid, kids a sense of fulfillment is just um, something that I think is going to have a, a pretty profound and positive impact moving forwards, regardless of what caused this. Uh, caused I, us to, to get I have a follow up for Pete, if I may. Uh, Please. Uh, so it, she's teaching outside, you said? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so I have an I have an ex who's Canadian, and she always referred to it as you know winter pig. So how long can one teach outside there before it I is mean, too cold to like put a brass instrument or whatever? How I mean you can still move your fingers. Like when does it? Like is this realistic to do for very long? In no, okay. no. 
no, it's it's not very re realistic to do for long, and it's um, the the reality is that that um, there's lots of logistical issues. Like the school field, it turns out is also the place the local neighbourhood takes their dogs for a walk. So on Friday morning, she had to text the principal with a code brown alert message before you could start teaching your classes. You had to, you know, clear up what other people didn't. So yeah, Winterpeg is pretty accurate. We adapt well to the cold, but ultimately when you're in the middle of a field on the outskirts of the city, you're still in the middle of a field on the outskirts of the city. So I think probably there's going to come a point where, where it has to go online again pretty pretty quickly and I think we're probably heading in that direction. Are only the music classes trying to do this or are other classes trying to do outdoor? No, so um, so what they're trying to do is keep keep cohorts um, and so of course phys ed and music teachers are the weak link in that because they would normally see all the kids so they're trying to do that but the kids go to the teacher outside so there's a lot less risk. I mean you know, um, she's, I already knew she had the most patience of anyone I'd ever met in my life. I think she probably needed that to, to want to marry me, but, but yeah, it's kind of crazy. And she was, she's doing like, she has the Fitbit on and she's doing 25,000 steps a day because it's in literally in the middle of the field. It's not just outside the school. So it's going there. And if a kid needs to go to the toilet, well, you got to go with the, the whole class to the toilet and keep them all distanced. And yeah, it's, it's wild absolutely wild but you know we are where we are and we're going to keep going and this is why we do what we do bless her bless her yeah yeah um i guess i'll jump in here first of all um i didn't know you're a liverpool fan and as a disclaimer i'm not into soccer but my spouse is and it sounds like well cheers to liverpool you all had a pretty good season right if yeah, i understand very good. yeah happy days Cheers. Well, he's a good guy. I can tell that already. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go ahead and tell him that. Um, but uh, just to add about the initiative, um, I thought a little bit about this, and I think it is, yeah, wonderful that the, there are these, like, small ensembles that, like, have been asking for this music for years. And admittedly, like, I kind of knew about this, but I was like, oh, I'll write something later. Well, I think now is the time to adapt our music, to give them the opportunity to do this. But also I was thinking it's a more democratic way of music making, you know, because you don't know who's going to show up to their ensemble. And it, it means that anybody could play a piece of music and that ultimately we're here to make music together, right? I think that's ultimately what I've been missing in COVID. Like, I, I, I like making music with people, yeah? And uh you know, we had a little bit of a setback, but now we're just giving more opportunities to make music together. And after COVID's over, which I hope is very soon because I am going crazy, like I'm naming the cats in the backyard. I don't know if that's anything, <laughs> like, but um, I, I think this repertoire is here to stay, you know, because there will always be small ensembles. There'll be people who just want to play together and make music. And I think that's beautiful in all this shit it also has been uh a thing in japan for some time um and uh, i have a, a distributor in japan that i use for like my difficult stuff and uh they're going to start distributing the this adaptable stuff also because they said just with uh ensembles getting smaller and smaller in japan because birth rates are getting lower and lower this is just the way a lot of ensembles in japan this is what they play at contest at least is this type of music. So through like, at all ranges of difficulty, um, you know, it's just kind of, a, unless it's a really specialized ensemble, you know, concert band in Japan, this is pretty common, um, even though I, like, I'm curious, have any of you who have like sent out your pieces, have you heard back from anyone what they're doing? Cause I'm like, I'm selling, a decent amount of this stuff, but I have not heard back from anyone, so I have no idea what anybody is actually doing. Like, what's playing part three? I have no, no idea. Like, how bonkers does this get? I'm just curious if any of you have had any, like, firsthand experience, either through, like, email or anything? Have you heard anything? I've had one yeah. conductor ask me 
what do you want the harp to do? And I'm like, they're like, can they play the flute slash violin part? I'm like, yeah, sure, man. <laughs> like, I, like, I have no control. I'm like, can they do new music for harp? Can they like, part of me is like, can you like purposely switch the pedals while they're plucking in it? Like, can you get like these gnarly sounds? But like, I, I assume that performers want to sound good and I just want like the crazy stuff. So I was like, yeah, that's cool. But other than that, I, I, I know that they're working on it. So I'm just very curious as to what they're gonna do. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say something. I uh, I wrote a piece actually for, uh, a, I would say Flex Band before I knew that that's what it was called, um, maybe two years ago actually. Um, so both pre-COVID and, uh, and it was a commission by a uh, band director, uh, some of you might know Elena Speck, who is a composer uh, who's here at Michigan State with me. And her husband's a band director and wor works uh, in a smaller school district. And he was saying, I've got one band and they're at like four different levels and all within the same band. And I've got this like star tuba player and some of these and some players who need like a grade two. And how can like there's no repertoire that exists for us for for someone for that type of thing and so he kind of gave me specifics what he wanted it to be and um i ended up writing writing this thing that was four parts and every performer could pick one of the four parts based on their skill level and the i actually unfortunately had to miss the premiere because i was at another premiere <laughs> but uh the it, that was the first time that two premieres happened on the same day but uh, in two different cities but the um the i was able to make it for a rehearsal and you know i was really surprised to find that the low brass all picked the part that i thought that the that the woodwinds would mostly pick and the woodwinds mostly picked the piece, the, the parts that the brass players mostly were going to, to go for. And it sounded wonderful. Like it, I, it's not where my head was, but uh, I was trying to think out like with not, I was trying to think beyond color and just like what everybody should have fun. Like, and, the, and cause at the end of the day, I personally believe band, particularly in, um, you know, middle school and high school should still be fun. Music, should, music making should be fun. Um, and uh, the students seemed to enjoy it, and I and I had to just sell them on it a little bit. But yeah, I mean, I, I was I was pretty happy with with it. So that's one of the reasons why I was excited to have you all here, is because this is something that I have been thinking about for a couple of years now. Not not just because of COVID, and I, I, I makes sense that COVID was the catalyst. But um, uh, but uh, I think that that's a that kind of leads me to to the next place is I know we were talking about rural districts and we were talking about COVID, um, but I'm curious how um, you know we've got these pieces that are you know in some cases might have been written for larger forces. Um, I know some composers uh, really really think about color, and I'm curious how you think about that when you, when you pare things down do you just is it do you think of it as a sacrifice or do you think of it as maybe no i'm gonna write a new piece and i'm just color is not gonna be in my mind or are you still thinking about that i'm i'm, I'm really curious mm -hmm. I would I would jump in and say that it's um, it's two different things. If you're going to adapt a piece, let's say a grade five piece that has beautiful colors and textures and very specific orchestration, it is likely not not entirely the case, but likely that it might not be as successful an adaptation because the colors the composer obviously put so much thought into the balance and the colors of of that particular piece. Um, if you start from scratch. I would say don't think of it so much as a limitation, but just think of it as another approach that you want to make sure that things are written in a way that will sound really good no matter who is playing them. And that's a different thing than trying to squid, um, fit a square peg into a round hole. So I, I find them two different mindsets. Like I was looking at my own catalog when this all started and I went through and I asterisked uh, the handful of pieces out of, you know, 15, 20 pieces um, that that I felt were right off the top without having me to do anything. Totally fine pieces to do. 
um, no matter what your personnel was going to be. And I, it turns out I'm right, I guess, because I've been, you know, selling a lot of them and I get the feedback from people about, hey, it's working fine. And I have an asterisk about that for in a second. But uh, I looked at some of my more sophisticated tone poemy kind of pieces. And I got to tell you, I was not able to find a way into creating an adaptable version of that, at least that would suit me artistically. So I just didn't bother. But instead, what I did earlier this summer is I wrote a new piece. Um, it's called Passages and it's a cell based piece. And it's kind of like what you did, Spencer, where it, there are it's grade two to four. You know, there's a lot of different choices for instrumentalists to make depending on their skill level. And I also got on that call, Jen, I got on that piece got the um, the same email from from somebody saying well what about the harp and the piano what should they do and in this case the um, the piece has a uh, dedicated percussion line and I just said you know what this is a great time for them to either use the, do some kind of percussion thing on their own instrument like the soundboard of the harp is really cool or just take something take this cognac bottle I don't care middle schooler cognac go for it hey this is you know cocktail repertoire initiative remember anyway <laughs> I said, just go for it and have them do something experimental with something around the house um, and, and let them play it that way. So that was my solution. And they liked that solution. I, I, you know, I wasn't going to you know, be very strict about it. And so that's how I dealt with it um, artistically as I went from the ground up and created something that I knew no matter who was playing it, it'll sound fine. You know, and um, and it, it, it's been working so far. I'm just going to like jump in here because like, yeah, there, I think there was a part of me when I got that harp comment where I was like, dude, like you could figure it out. And then I realized that, that a lot of these musicians and maybe conductors are not used to like improvising mm -hmm. or like creating things. So I, I'm glad we could help them out. But part of me is like, there are notes here. You just harp, go from, you know, like low to high. But like, I, yeah, I helped them out too. Um, and the second thing is, um, just to echo what you were saying, like, I think that, you know, in our own catalog, some pieces are adaptable, some pieces are not, but maybe just starting from scratch is kind of the way to go. And actually, I assigned one student in my studio to like, look at your passages, because you have this like, not like a text score, pretty much of like how to do it. And because they're like, how do you write a flex piece? Like, I can't, I can't imagine like giving up color or whatever. I'm like, okay, so that's out the window. But like, here's a template and why don't you like not listen to Alex Shapiro's piece because you got to do your own thing and just like follow these instructions and see what happens. That's a great segue for me to toss in plug for CRI and the whole point of, of this initiative and all of us are, you know, almost half of, of it. It, you know, CRI was started by um, uh, the brainchild of uh, Robert Ambrose, Alan McMurray and Frank to Kelly. And they made various calls to all of us and uh, and brought the rest of us on board. And you can see it from creativerepertoire.com is the email, is the website address. And you can check out what we're doing. But one of the things that Jen just said is really important. We formed together, there are what, 11 of us, 12 of us, something like that. Uh, we formed together as working composers, mostly, you know, mostly we, have, we're, we tend to be known in the band world, but we all write a lot of other things as well, obviously. Um, and we formed together for two reasons. One was for us, the core group, to start writing these flex pieces and, and adaptable pieces. And we all have done that, I think, pretty much. Um, and then the other, very significantly, was to reach out to all of our peers around the world or the country or whatever. And uh, by dint of our Facebook group, which now has over 5,000 members, it's unbelievable, 5,000 members. And they're all really cool. And uh, we, um, we formed this group to be able to make sure that, to encourage other composers around the world to write these adaptable pieces and we formed the facebook group to have a place where they can post them and there are a lot of band directors who are members of that group and they see these pieces and we're basically a dating service we're a yenta service for adaptable music that's what C cri is but we came together to do that and what jen just said about passages for instance we immediately in the very beginning of cri when we put the website together we have a whole section uh, uh, called um, resources, I think that's what it's called. And it's a pull down menu, you go to the page, go to the page, creativerepertoire.com. You wanna go there, you know you do. And you go there and you're gonna see all these templates 
from a bunch of us on how we did what we did. And they're all really different approaches. It's very, very cool. And it's like, it's an entire composition lesson, boom, right there. If you're curious about how to either adapt something that you have in your catalog or how to start from scratch on something, you will find a trove of information. And it, it just gives us all the warm and fuzzies, really. Even without the bourbon, we would have the warm and fuzzies about you know the success of this because it meant so much to us to see this blossom and to see so many of our peers you know take up the charge and put all, all this new repertoire into the world and and you know one one thing that i really love about the facebook group is because <clears throat> obviously over the last three four five years has been uh, a strong um push to to widen the scope of who composes music and who has a platform and in a, a very cool way, the Facebook group has kind of given a, a level platform for absolutely everybody who wants to take part in writing music and connecting them almost directly to band directors, which was a platform that was never there before and was a struggle for younger or emerging composers to, to find. And so all of a sudden, actually, aside from being something pretty functional for the times we're in and something that will last beyond in, as I said, rural communities, teaching courses, all those sorts of things. It actually has provided like a central platform where, you know, if John posts a piece, it's equal to someone who's only just composed their first piece posting a piece. And I kind of like that. And the teachers clearly, cause you can see, I, I don't know about you guys, but the orders you get in, it's lots of different people from lots of different places. So people are going through, they're checking out lots of different people's music. So it's it's just a really very cool thing that is another, um, I know when we, we spoke about having the Facebook group and, and we, we really were keen from pretty early on to make sure that, that all composers were involved. I don't know that we had a, a scope of, an idea of the scope of the platform it would provide. And I'm pretty proud of, of that platform that, that we, we have right there. Yeah. Match.composer. <laughs> right or left. I mean, I don't even know how that all works, but well, I think we figured something out. So we never expected it would be this many people and it's still growing. So, you know, come back in two months, it'll be seven grand or whatever. It'll be a, a big number. It's amazing. And it, it shows you just how many artists there are who are so willing and eager to, you know, to contribute and do this. It's, it's, it's really beautiful. And we should say as well, it's all data-based as well. Yeah. Um, I don't have the the link off by heart. Alex, you know these sorts of things. The link can go in the description below. Yeah. The link will definitely go in the description below. Yeah. Um, that. There are many different ways of doing an adaptable ensemble type piece. Um, I'm sure some are more successful than others. Can you talk a little bit about things that have worked, things that maybe haven't worked? Yeah, I would say that um, when we talk about adaptable music, I think there's also adaptable approaches too. I think um, we put them into categories because it's kind of like a tool. Like I think if you were just to give to somebody like, you can do whatever you want. Or it's like what I like to say to my students, it's America. And I guess quite possibly Canada in this place, you know, <laughs> but, yeah. but you know, it's, it, it's like, you know, so, so we gave them some guidelines because I think you know, especially for those who've never written flex ensembles or never written music or never written music for bands, like composing can be scary because you're faced with a lot of decisions. Um, I think that composing is difficult if you're like faced with a whole bunch of decisions you don't know what you're wanting to do. And so like, I like that you were writing a graphic score because, you know, in a way you're giving creative control to the ensemble members. Like, and this is why I was mentioning that it's a more democratic way of music making is that you're letting other people create, which I think is quite wonderful. And I will also mention that, um, because I'm, I'm running on tangents since I'm on my second drink right here, which is very pink, but it's Texan, I promise. So um, it, it allows like people to learn how to compose and learn how to make music and communicate with each other. Um, and I think what's, what's great about CRI is that we're not only encouraging people to play this flex repertoire that we're giving them flex repertoire, but we're also encouraging them to compose too, depending on what kind of flex piece they decide. Um, there are multiple ways you can write 
for flex ensembles, right? You, you know, I feel like in a way that's adaptable too. Um, so I don't know if this is necessarily answering your question, but even though you feel like you haven't really written anything for a long time and myself included, it's, it's been a time, right? I think everybody here can attest to that. Um, there are different ways of creating music and there's different ways of sharing this joy of creation or the stress, like however you want to discuss it, but um, that ultimately we're, we're doing our best in these times and adapting to these times. I, mean, I think it's related to the fact that you have, you have multiple categories on the website um, and uh, that talk about the different types of, the, the different types of things. And I gathered that is to show people that there are lots of different ways to write music and there isn't just one way of, of engaging with this? No, I, I was gonna say, I feel like uh, probably of, you know, those of us who are here right now that uh, Jen and Alex would, and I shouldn't speak for Pete. I'm curious to hear what Pete has to say about this. Um, like Jen and Alex are, I think, pretty, to use the word, adaptable in, the, in their approach to how to do this. Um, <laughs> For me, it is it just it's a struggle, honestly. Like so, to do to to take existing pieces, I just have to like, you know, you, I think someone at some point said, you know, in reference to a question or something, like, uh, you know, some composers, you know, really are you know concerned about like the color and things or whatever, you know, and that's that's like first and foremost when I'm writing a piece is the color of it. So to strip that away. Uh, I have to just be okay with this idea that the things that I, if they're adapted from existing pieces, all of the thought that I put into like, this is the doubling I want, or this, I put this, you know, I want piccolo and octave above soprano sax, and it's never going to be in tune, but that's the point. Like there's, you know, all of those choices are just gone. They're just erased. Uh, and that's a struggle. And I subscribe one piece that is like, uh, from scratch for this instrumentation uh, called Let Me Be Frank. But the, what I did with that, honestly, when I wrote it is I wrote it to full score band so that I could hear what it would sound like if your adaptable ensemble happened to be an entire wind ensemble. So that's completely cheating, but it sounded really good. So, uh, but it's very, very hard for me to like write it and think, all right, I'm just gonna like, give part one to piccolo and part two to E flat clarinet and part three to like, you know, tenor sax and part four to, you know, I, I don't, I don't, Ophiclide, I don't, is that even a bass instrument? I don't know what Ophiclide is, but like probably, you know, you get my, like it's, it's very, very hard for me to write something that where the instrumentation is not first and foremost, what's playing it. Um, so, uh, you know, Bach works with any instrumentation, but you know, things written, post Bach don't necessarily. So I think this is a big adjustment for those of us who have spent our entire writing lives thinking, you know, what's the color going to be? And so Pete, when you have done your stuff, is it that hard for you or do you, can you remove yourself from, because I feel like with Jen and Alex, they are so used to incorporating improvisation or electronics or, you know, maybe like being like super flexible, like you're playing this and you can play this and that'd be fine. But I think probably Pete, you and I are yeah. less, do less of that just in practice. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, yeah. I, I will chime in very quickly. I'll have to say, John, that there's some pieces where I'm like, I have no effing idea what to do and that I probably have to lobotomize myself to like, do it, you know, because I'm thinking of like some of my grade five pieces, I'm like, yeah, if somebody really wants to play that as a flex ensemble, I'm hoping that somebody else does it for me because like, I just, right? Because you talk about the color, it's different. So it's like, that's why I'm like, start from scratch because like, no. But anyway, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll jump in too, just to say, uh, before Pete speaks, <laughs> we're jumping in on Pete's time, but just to uh, um, amplify what Jen is saying, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, is that there are gonna be some pieces and maybe quite a number of pieces in all of our catalogs don't adapt them. Just don't. They are, we, we spend as composers a great deal of time on color and texture. Those textures matter, at least to us. 
don't mess with them really sure i mean just go, go like ask the composer i would say this to any any director any band director ensemble director watching i would just say if you love a piece and if you would like to adapt it for your smaller ensemble that's beautiful and thank you but please please drop us an email we're all alive kicking living drinking just please drop us an email and ask us and two things will happen either we'll say no way it's just not going to work or let me take a closer look and make some suggestions but it's it's really it's the composer's um uh, bailiwick to to control the color and the texture of a piece so not every piece is going to work well look i i agree with john this i this was just so hard like unbelievably hard and the Number one, it's hard right in, in in few parts as opposed to there's always a way out of some I think you said earlier, Jen, about it's about decision all composing is decision making, right? You make a decision and live with the consequences of that decision. And the better you get at looking all the way down that decision tree, the better composer you become. And all of a sudden a whole load of decisions are, like potentials are taken away from us because the example you gave of a piccolo and tenor sax playing, you know it's going to be out of tune, so it's going to have a certain impact. You know if you have certain textures that we all go back to for ourselves that are in our personal sort of toolbox, we know what the effect of them is. And once you take that away, you you lose the ability to make certain decisions. You've got to make other decisions, right? And writing in chamber music anyway was hard enough to start off with. But I think for me, like I, I did a couple of pieces that pre-existed and I wrote three others. And the ones I wrote, I think, are the pieces I want to hear more than the ones I reduced. In the same way, like it's the same feeling as writing a concerto and making a piano reduction of the accompaniment. Because really, you, I, I don't know about any of you, I want two pianists. Like, so they can play all the different lines. I wanted all those lines. There's a reason why that third little line on second horn or something was there. I, I needed it. And all of a sudden now you, your pianist apparently only got 10 fingers, which seems a bit unfair on, on all those things that I wanted to happen. And they can't play five different dynamics at once. So yeah, it's kind of that feeling. And I always, I never like listening to piano reductions of concertos either. And I think a little bit like this, you have to take yourself out of it being your baby, you know? It's, you have to yeah. kind of take it away. Really, I think maybe the smartest thing for us all to do would have to done each other's. How, how are, you know, how do you think that the, the field of writing for, for band and just as a composer has changed with being adaptable in mind as part of, you know, as part of your creative practice. Does that question make sense? Yeah. I'll start. But before I answer it, I'm going to make a plug that when you have your cherries for your Manhattan, you want to make sure to take the jar, add bourbon to it, put it in the fridge. Trust me, you'll have marinated bourbon cherries. Very good. Okay, that's my pro tip for you guys on the on the cocktails because don't forget this is cocktails with composers the cocktail repertoire initiative all right now to spencer's question um i think that all of us probably as we go forward on so many levels not just music but life hygiene everything we are impacted very strongly by the past year and beyond a year because it's not just these six months we know this is going on for a long time uh, so yes, that will make some permanent changes. Many of them are good changes. Um, I, I have to say for all of the losses that we have experienced, first and foremost, live music and resonating with each other's pheromones in a room, uh, making music, making cocktails, having dinner in a restaurant, all those things. Uh, we, we deeply miss that and that will come back. But there are other things that, for instance, this format, Zoom or whatever, has been really good for, and we all know that too. And it's a matter of taking with us the good as we move forward. And one of the goods, I think, certainly in music, is our creative thinking in terms of the scope 
of a piece. One of the things that I started saying early on that I just want to share with whoever's watching who happens to be a composer is, you know, I, I for anybody who knows what I do, which is maybe, you know, two of you watching and three ferrets or something, I'm known for my electroacoustic large ensemble work. So I'm seamlessly blending uh, a pre-recorded track, in my case, uh, pre-recorded to a live ensemble, whether it's orchestra or band. And I have to tell you guys the secret sauce here. I backed into this. I would never have known this, but oh my gosh, it's exactly what people, for better or for worse, need under these circumstances. It's very helpful. For those of you who happen to write electroacoustic or are interested in trying your hand at electroacoustic music, I want to say that as we talk about the future of band music and the future of large ensemble music, the future of music, it is a wonderful thing to add an additional separate section of your ensemble that is not emulating any of the instruments. Do not emulate them. They can play that part, right? Do not pretend to be a fake bassoon. Don't do it. But you can have all these textures and pitches and registrations that are, you know, the sky's the limit, sounds and sound design that's amazingly beautiful and effective that will also carry forward into situations that maybe are less than ideal when some musician is actually recording their part in their bedroom and sending it in for a big mix. I mean, I think several of us are probably dealing with that now. We're being sent, um, you know, uh, compilation recordings. Uh, they're not performances, they are recordings, these virtual performances. They are produced recordings, some better produced than others, but the production is very important of the essence of a work. That's all good. I mean, if you're a composer like me and probably my colleagues, it's like we, we're happy to have people playing the music. That's a very important thing. We want to give the music to people to play. That's the point. So if they have to do it in a way that is a little more virtual or, or dare I say artificial from the original intent, intent, okay, that's all right. What I have been doing is, for those of you who are doing electroacoustic music or, or pieces with significant um, electronic factors, uh, I, I first of all, I give people the gratis, in my case, sync rights. I just say what I want in return, because if it's educational music, it's not like there's money involved. This is not Steven Spielberg asking you for a sync license, okay? So I, I put it up front. I say, you're welcome you know, to have the sync rights because I'm the publisher. If you're not published by yourself, your publisher has to offer this, by the way, little pro point there. It's a copyright issue. But anyway, give them the sync rights and then just say, as I do, just say, you know what, I would love it. My only request is that before you post it to YouTube or whatever, please show it to me first. Let me weigh in on it. Maybe I can suggest a better balance. It's usually a mix and balance issue. It usually is. And sometimes it, somebody, somebody, you know, that trombonist in their bedroom needs a bit more reverb. Trust me, they do. <laughs> um, you need more room presence for the mix. But anyway, you make a few suggestions for the mix. Boom, it's 100% better. Then they can post it and it's a, it makes them feel great. It's a represent, representation of the work. So think of those things as you go forward. Uh, consider writing pieces that do use track do have a click track at least even if they're acoustic that people can um, record to under these circumstances a lot of people are in blended or online situations and think about the sync rights and think about having some control over the end product also think about always offering to zoom yourself in to work with them because it's really great to do so that's my ending thoughts and my spiel just particularly, not only for band directors to hear, but especially our wonderful peers and our wonderful co-composers, you know, out there in the world. Um, I just want to give you a few extra ideas of sort of what I've been doing over the past few months. Cheers. I would just say that I think that um, even though this is such a different genre and such a different way of approaching writing music, because again, I've taken like many orchestration classes. I feel like um, when I was an undergrad at USC, they prided themselves on like orchestration and certain instrumental choices that um, maybe it's a time for non-composers actually to, to get on this. You know, what's the worst that can happen? So you fail, but what does that even mean right now? We don't even, we don't even have, <laughs> complete ensembles like you know what i'm saying like 
I think that it's it's great to like just try something out and experiment. I mean, we are so desperate for music making right now that I think it just doesn't hurt to try something. And like, I'm not even an expert on flex instrumentation. Like I have a pretty good idea as to like what works for me personally. Um, it is hard. Like I will second both like John and Pete. It is really difficult. It's not something that we were taught in school. It's not something that we're really taught in general. So like just try something um, and see what happens. I, I mean, I think that a lot of instruments like instrumental groups and a lot of directors are just willing to like give something to their students and try something. So um, if there's one thing you all take from this is like, if you haven't composed anything before, just, I think just do it. And for the composers who are like, what is going on? I'm, I'm just saying, just do it. And you don't have to, you know, again, it's America and quite possibly Canada. Okay. But just easy now. You a little bit. Well, it's North America. How, how's that? It's North America. Um, and the world, you know, this is something the whole world needs. Like, as John mentioned earlier, like there are Japanese ensembles that don't even like, they, they use flex instrumentation. So what's the worst that can happen? I would say break new ground and just do the thing. And we're all here for you. Yeah. I think the one thing I would say is the, just to take from that is, uh, that I, my background tends to be pretty rigid as far as my approach to writing anything like if you look at my scores uh, every note has some kind of phrase marking or articulation or whatever and you know a lot of time is spent make like very specific choices about all of that and um this uh it's been uh, it's been told to me uh by uh my spouse that uh uh what i tend to be uh a bit too binary in my approach to the work everything is either perfect or it's garbage. And this has been actually very helpful for me to like uh, lessen that frigid, uh, 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 not frigidity, that's a different thing, uh, yes. So, uh, <laughs> 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 I, uh, I, anyway, I'm a bit, uh, I've like mellowed a bit, we'll, a little bit, a little bit, uh, we'll say as far as just like that whole approach, uh, because you know, you don't know what's going to play these pieces and uh, they, are, they, can, they can still be useful and they can still sound good and be positive experience for the teachers and the students, ideally. And uh, so in that way, uh, I think that's good. I mean, I'm still gonna be a pain in the ass about your mallets if I show up and you're playing an actual concert band piece. But uh, other than that, I think, you know, this has maybe been, I mean, we'll, have, we'll do this again and we'll ask Abby if it's made me any uh, more pleasant to be around, and I'm not sure it has, but, but uh, hopefully down the line. John, can I just say, can you please tell Abby this? Um, there was a time I was in my therapist session, and she was like, you need to stop having as much control over things, and my first thought was like, does she not know she's talking to a composer? Right. And I said that to my spouse, and he's like, does she not know that she just told a composer that? So I just... Can you please tell Abby that I haven't met her? She sounds amazing. But that my therapist told me to not have control over things. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Okay. I, I so have to jump in on this because some of you know that I, I've been running a curriculum around the country that is all about online composing with ensembles, you know, playing their instruments, being part of a community, and actually composing. And one of the things I've been saying to this point. You know, composers are the are the ultimate control freaks, right? Every articulation, every phrasing, everything, right? That's the joy of it, and 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 the uh, and what our spouses bemoan, of course. But one of the things I've been saying is that in this time, in 2020 and beyond, when we are so out of control, we feel such anxiety, we feel so much uncertainty, we, we are just crazed with the lack of control around us, uh, beyond voting giving money, whatever you can do, right? There's like no control. And I say to everybody, aligning notes, putting sounds next to each other, 
dealing with audio files or notes on a page or anything in between it's the ultimate control and it gives us it that's our therapy i think everybody here would agree that is our therapy and we want to give that to everybody else and and i've been saying this to all these students all these university students like dudes you know get into this this will this will give the world sense so i just had to jump on what jen was saying and, and john before that because it's so true you know composing is about control and and the world is not about control right now so we have to find our place in that and art will help us all find our place whether we're talking about professional level art with symphony orchestras or whatever or educational art with younger players it's all the same so i'm pretty sure spencer i could um pitch you an idea that your next cocktails with creatives should instead be cocktails with creatives partners and they can just <laughs> They can oh, tell you what it's yeah. like to, to, to oh, live. Great idea. My oh, and planner. <laughs> um, I think, look, for me, it's this is a, almost a two-part answer. One on a personal level that, for me, life was a pretty, <clears throat> I don't know if I really knew this until I didn't have it, but a pretty fine balance of a lot of time by myself, which I enjoyed, that's the time where you write music. It's the time where I do a million things, watch Netflix, watch sports. It doesn't matter. It's, it's my space. Then there's, and that's kind of introvert time. Then there's the extrovert time in the pub with friends and having a laugh and making jokes and all the rest of it. But then there was always this like 10% of time where at lunchtime I'd go to the little pub around the corner and I'd go for a pint and just people watch and just be around other people and real life. And it was nothing to do with music or, or anything like that. It was just being around people. And to have lost what was a really delicate balance was really difficult because I didn't know it was the balance, right? And we took so much for granted and probably rightly so. I mean, you, why would you ever really have a handle on all of those things? I mean, it's just, we live life, we do what we do. And so redefining all of that at the same time as, and this is a thing I guess that's a wider thing for composers, at the same time as having to get over our usual, is paranoia the right word? Like composers, are, we're all notoriously bad at kind of convincing ourselves that what we just wrote was shit. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, what was bad about that passage? I kind of like it, but what was bad about it? Who did I steal that from? Are people gonna notice where I steal that from? That's more mine. <laughs> but you know, like, and so, so we're dealing with so many internal things at the same time as there's this huge external thing to deal with. And I think um, as ridiculous as this sounds, like composers should know that you're not alone. And, and if it's taught me anything, the value of speaking to other composers and spending time with other composers, not even talking about composing, just like that time with similar mindsets, because I don't think there's people like composers on earth. I think it's a unique set of things that leads you towards doing that. And whilst of course there's different personalities, there's still something that bonds people together. And so being able to share time together, I think things like this, things like our CRI meetings have been, I think we'd all agree have been therapy for all of us. And I like, and um, I, I always like to use golf analogies that sometimes you know, if you put the ball on the tee and you don't swing at the ball with your club, then it's still not going to go anywhere. And I guess those meetings kind of made me swing at the the ball a bit, you know, and and, and so I'm very grateful for friends here and, and, and all of us who are on those meetings. But I guess the other the other thing moving forwards is that all the reasons that we do music for the the hope and the love and the beauty and and the healing and all those things and the empathy and compassion that it teaches us, which this is where Canada and America are different. We're not quite as crazy as you guys are right, right now down there. Fingers, fingers crossed that that changes very, very soon. But all those things are the things that the world needs most right now. And as musicians, as creative people, we're able to kind of give them what feels like the least. Like in my 40 years on earth, I've never felt less empowered to sort of be able to go and work with people and give what I have to give and and share the love that I, I, I have for music and for life. But by doing 
by doing this, by writing these charts, I think we are still doing that. It's just delivered in a different way. It's making sure that little John or Jilly or whoever who've never played an instrument before have, are able to find joy in music making. And you know what? It certainly, I'm like John says, I'm kind of a bit more frigid or rigid. Which one was it? I right? Rigid, but if you can't be rigid, and I don't quite know how that. Again, I blame. Anyway, go on. It could go either way. It could go either way. But <laughs> I, I think I'm a bit more. My training is a bit more like that. It's a bit more organized, and and so to have to let go of all of that. Part of the way I was able to do it was by remembering that young kids who've never picked up an instrument before are able to make music in a, at a time where otherwise they wouldn't have been able to. And everybody who contributes to the, the ever-growing flex, adaptable repertoire just is part of making sure that music and music education is part of what makes this world go around. And I think there's really actually huge potential for it to come out stronger the other side if we get organized and if we're smart about it i think actually we can we can really find a stronger base and, and move forwards yes all to everything that everybody just said yes um i these are these are things that i've been thinking about a lot in the last six months uh i my own music has gone in places that i didn't think it would and I appreciate that people are thinking about these things because they are important. Um, we do have to be adaptable because if we aren't writing music right now, like, I, I, I don't know about you, but my identity is tied to writing music and finding ways to write music so that people can still play it are, are really, is really important to me. And I, I appreciate that that the four of you and, and also the, the rest of the initiative um, have really taken it upon yourselves, um, particularly with the fact that all of you are, are fairly well known in, in at least the band community um, and, and can be leaders in, in, this, in this space. And I really appreciate that um, because I think that, that people look to you for for that advice because they you know they really really i feel like they really need it right because they because they don't want to they don't there's this idea of rocking the boat and 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 doing something different right and and i think that it's it's really it feels if there's this like refreshing uh point of view to have people who are actually being leaders right now. And so I, so thank you for, for, for doing that. Um, the, I, I don't know about you, but I'm two drinks in. And I, I, I think that we had a really good conversation. What do you think? Yes. Yeah, so, cheers. Uh, I think that that's a good place to stop. Um, the, Please like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, share, comment below. I'm sure the people who are here, if you have questions for them, they've got a Facebook group, you should join it um, if you haven't already. And uh, you know, this was a really good hour of my life. So thank you all for being here. Spencer, thank you so much for inviting us into your space. You know, you create this space. And the series is so wonderful. And this is just yet another really cool conversation in a long series. Thanks to you. So thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Spencer. Here, cheers to Spencer. Oh, cheers, Spencer. <laughs> and cheers, Spencer, cheers. I just have to say, Spencer, you guys have to all who are watching, check out his music. He's a wonderful composer. He's a wonderful human being. Check it out.